welcome back to another episode of, um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm like in a singing mood today. Um, but welcome to another session of a uh, weekly study session where uh, essentially every Thursday, the day of Juhuti, uh, we get together, we gather, and um, we can either read together or just listen and I'll read, comment, talk to each other about uh, different books that have to do with the Kemetic Legacy as well as wisdom texts of the Kemetic Legacy. So, um, this week we are continuing with the book uh, Ancient Egypt and Black Africa by Theophile Obinga. Ankama Atma Akara. <laughs> so, um, we are picking up on page 33 and um, so essentially we were going through, uh, we're in the first chapter, we went through the introduction. Uh, so we are in the first chapter and um, what the author was doing was um, essentially just giving a whole bunch of primary source texts. So um, the reader, I guess, just has a better background and stuff like that. Uh, I really like this list uh, from the few of the books that I did start Googling afterwards and then I got a little, not gonna lie, got a little overwhelmed and I was just like, oh my gosh, I, <laughs> these are so many things I'm gonna have to buy or download and so, you know, I was just like, you know what, when the time is right, when I'm, you know, ready for new books, at least I know I could come back to this one and I have a plethora of choices of things to add. So, as a side note, if you live on the East Coast, and um, you are experiencing this extreme uh, shoe and tefnut today. Um, I hope that everybody gets home safely because uh, Minya is not gonna lie. She heard that the weather was gonna be a little shum shum and I left my windows open, <laughs> big mistake. So uh, <laughs> I came home and a whole lot of water was all over my home. So. Um, I hope that everybody is uh, dry, safe. Um, you know, I did hear it was going to be more flash flood warning, so I just, I just hope that everyone is um, just asking Empu to open the way to for safe passage to come home or go home to uh, everyone's family. So, uh, all right. So let's start. Um, so last week we talked about the old kingdom the first intermediate period, and now we're in the middle kingdom, so I'm just gonna kind of finish us up. Uh, so the teaching of Amenhat to his sons, I'm sorry, to his son, uh, Sesotris, which I'm like, mm, that sounds mighty Greek, but okay. Uh, here's a pessimistic vision of the world where the good people are caused unpleasantness. Whoever trusts his friends is betrayed by them. That's interesting that that's middle kingdom and not a not something that would be an intermediate period. So go figure. Uh, satire of Trades, the work of Keti, son of Duauf. The importance of this composition lies in the detailed and satirical description of various manual trades, blacksmith, carpenter, um, barber, potter, shoemaker, which enables us to get an idea of social and artisanal life at the time. The only profession which appears to be noble and appealing to the profession of a scribe, uh, it is a eulogy of intellectual life in ancient Kemet, which I, oh, that's kind of interesting. I think that's only interesting because, um, you know, this year I am teaching AP uh, U.S. History again, and we just went over, like, what is satire? And it's just very interesting because so many people laugh at satire but don't quite understand, uh you know, what it's really about. Um, they just kind of get to the surface and stay there and that's all. So I think it's very interesting and I do remember, um, oh, there they are, that's what I said, I was about to talk about it. In the Miriam Litcham book, the really cool thing about her, her books um, of the literature of ancient Kemet is that she kind of talks about the different, um, like she sets you up and talks you through the history of how uh, certain features within literature existed at what time periods and how you could tell the difference. Uh, so like 
this time period they really wrote more in prose this time period they really just did record keeping this time period so it's really cool um you know to go back to uh any of these three books there and i guess um you know maybe she, i'm not sure because um it's been a while <laughs> But just referring back to them and just saying, like, I wonder if satire was a feature of Middle Kingdom writing, which I imagine would be the yellow book, the middle one, if I'm not mistaken. I think I have them in order. I'm judging myself right now in my organization. <laughs> uh, Tales of Westcard Papyrus. The fourth tale is very instructive. Uh, King Shopes asked the magician... Uh, <laughs> the first thing I wanted to say is Jedi. <laughs> That's not it. Did Jedi, uh, is it true, Did Jedi, that you can put back a chopped head? After Did Jedi's affirmative answer, the king commands, bring the prisoner from the prison after his execution. And Did Jedi answers, no, not a human being, my master and king, because it is forbidden to do such a thing um, on Netcher's sacred flock. But Did Jedi will succeed with two geese and an ox. Capital punishment does not seem to have existed in ancient Kemet. That is for the country's subjects. So um, I think I remember reading that. I think we read that in the Budge book. In the, um, the book, it was the purple cover and it was like talking about amulets and things like that. I think we remember reading that because they were talking, I believe, about Hekau and the power of Hekau. And in the rest of that story, it goes on to say like, uh, so he wanted to see it. And um, uh, Dejeti was just like, you know, he put he, he said Hekau and then the animals came back to life and stuff like that. I think that's a very interesting thought. Um, just in general about the relationship between uh, human beings and animals and like sacrifice and the idea that, um, you know, we can be literal or we can be figurative in talking about um, the relationship and, and, you know, kind of bringing something back to life. But again, is it literal or are we being figurative? Are we trying to talk about uh, spiritually bringing it back or honoring the energy that was within that living being? Um, and I think it's interesting that he differ uh, differentiated between um, executing a human or um, like a ritual killing, I suppose you, you could put it, of a human versus of an animal. So I think that's very interesting just overall because, I mean, we do know that they did have uh, human sacrifice at some time, early, early, early time in uh, ancient Kemetic history. But, um, you know, that just, they ended up not doing it. And um, from what I've seen, they said like uh, when the Nisut died, Pretty much the royal court uh, around them got killed too as like, you know, these are all the people who are going to be needed uh, when the Nasut goes on into the field of reeds. So, um, <laughs> and then over time they were just like, um, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. And then that, you know, that's when, um, if you've been to like the museums and stuff, they, they have, um, I forget the act, the the uh, official name, but they have like the wooden carvings of people making bread and uh, people weaving cloth and and stuff like that. So those are like placeholders um, for actual humans to do the, that work. And um, this was before they made um, Merkut or pyramids that they um, that. Um, they say like the the rituals that they did as far as burying people uh before they really started building recruits and then after that um putting the nasut in like the um the valley of the nasut i imagine um that uh it, it was like a very flat thing and they said you could see the way the people were like lined up it's kind of like they were just executed eventually um one near the other and you know, like, that's how you could tell, like, human sacrifice was most likely a thing back then. Uh, but again, I think it's interesting, like, knowing that and now looking at this story of Dejeti and, you know, saying, like, no, um, 
how did it say it's forbidden to do such a thing to net your sacred flock now i would also want to go back and see like well what's the original wording was the wording actually a flock as in like you know because as a as a modern person i hear flock and that has like very abrahamic connections uh like that's a trigger word so i'm just wondering if um as Obinga was writing this, like, did he take liberty in certain words? Which I'm not sure if I think he would do that. But, um, you know, I wonder if that word choice was on purpose or if that's really what it was back then. I think that would be interesting to uh, look at. Uh, so the next from the middle, middle kingdom, we got the coffin text. That's the end of 11th and 12th dynasty. Uh, the orientation of these texts is written in the sides of sarcophagi. Uh, is a text of the pyramids of the old kingdom it is once again about giving the um, people who passed away the benefits of a happy immortality through participation in the osarian mysteries these texts are therefore a formula for re-establishing life uh, through the union of the deceased with a divinity it was declared that each part of the um, mummified corpse was that of a netcher side note and random at the same time um i remember i was watching a documentary and the the egyptologist who was in there was saying that um that one of the reasons for the death mask if you will for them making it in gold is the idea that the Neturu were uh made of gold they were light beings therefore you wore this mask uh so that the Neturu would recognize you as one of their own. So I think it's interesting that it says, um, that declared that when you passed away, and again, this is, you know, at that time period, this was for the Nisut, these were for the aristocracy and so on and so forth, so that they would be understood and their their bodies or their corpses be declared part of nature in general. So I think, I just think like visually, that's very interesting, but then also the idea of using natural minerals to kind of associate and reinforce uh, one's own divinity is like, you know, I mean, we do it all the time. We wear jewelry, we, you know, we adorn ourselves and so on and so forth. But I mean, to think of it on that level, um, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, New Kingdom 1590 to 1085 BCE. That is when uh, the Pert and Haru, because I'm not going to read it like that. The Pert and Haru, these are texts on papyri illustrated in vignettes placed near um, the people who passed away in their coffers. Uh, the Kometiu referred to it as the Book of Coming Forth by Day. Uh, this title was written on the outside of the scroll, which contained the formulae placed on the, at the dead's disposal. It is a compilation of 100. A formulas 192 chapters in modern editions uh, these formulae date back to the 18th dynasty to the 26th around 600 BCE these formulae are supposed to allow the deceased to be united to the Sun uh, which during the nightly travels through the sky or the duat and join it again coming out into the day oh, okay look at him make it okay you see the camera kind of shaking a little bit that's the cat she over here like moving around sorry um so i think that is also interesting because especially for people who maybe have not read the whole part in haru or have not um kind of dealt dove divin i'm making up words now that's been me all day i've been just making up words <laughs> oh i'm sorry i amused myself so um you know, if, if one has not dove into uh, the wisdom text like that, uh, or they don't have context, so it's just like, okay, I'm reading this, I kind of get pieces here and there. Because I do think the wisdom texts are definitely like that, especially if you are a serious practitioner, or you consider yourself a serious practitioner. Like, the more you read... Uh, the various wisdom texts, the more you're going to like understand, get out of it, the more like secondhand, um, not secondhand information, secondary sources that you go through to kind of help give you context and understanding, the more it's going to make sense. So this just made a few connections for Minyak. So um, the fact that it said 
And I'm like, I feel kind of like a little dude, like dummy here because allow the deceased to unite with the sun through, you know, after the night's travel and come again in today. And I'm like, why did I never think of that before? Like truly, why did I never think of like, that is so literal and it makes sense. Like as a person traverses through like underworld or you know, whatever kind of modern word you wanna use for it and come back in today, coming back into the light. And I'm like, duh. (laughs) Even if we wanted to speak, like I, I suppose just even more spiritual and not necessarily as literal, just the idea of, you know, the the journey of the ka in general, like the journey of your soul, the journey of it, you know, going through the process of um, leaving a, a actual physical body and going through that darkness and going back to the light. And I think of this especially because, um, you know, there I love Korean dramas. If you're new here, I love Korean dramas. So sometimes I reference them. And there is one, if you're ever interested, it's called The Uncanny Counter. And it has a lot to do with, like, uh, death and, and, like, you know, bringing souls to the afterlife and, and spirits and evil spirits and stuff like that. So it's just it just kind of made me think of that where um, they have this or the visual when a person passes away and it's literally like breath leaving a person and their soul is leaving. And I I imagine like, you know, leaving your physical body and kind of traveling out and not being at your final destination is like a tunnel. It's like going through the night and waiting for the morning. So I'm like, that is like on so many levels makes such perfect sense and is such a perfect name in general. And I'm like, gosh, why didn't I think of that? Like, you know something, but then you you hear something else and it just kind of all clicks. Like, that was me. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. (laughs) All right, so uh, moving forward. Um, One must mention chapter 125, commonly called the Negative Confessions or the Declaration of Innocence, a.k.a. that's where we get the 42 Tepra and Ma'at, which partially reflects a moral ideal already present in funerary inscriptions of some high-ranking officials in the time of the Old Kingdom. The admirable vignette which ornates this chapter in the Papyrus of Ani uh, depicts a scene of psychostasia or thought of the heart the great hymn of Aten, uh kept in the tomb of one of uh, Ankenaten's officials I literally a y a or unless I'm saying a but I'm gonna say I like I'm a pirate Arr. let me stop anyway the literary and philosophical value of this document has been emphasized many times this hymn to Aten contains precious speculations on nature Ooh, that's interesting so definitely circling that one. Uh, the wisdom of Ani, advice on prayer, good education, behavior with women. Ooh, that might be something, <coughs> excuse me. That might be something that um, we need to revisit when it comes to, um, you know, just reestablishing uh, the comedic legacy in the 21st century. like what that looks like is because it says even here education of children preparation for death so that's a like the wisdom of ani is definitely something that modern practitioners need to be reading for context for uh foundation and and things like that so like shout out to obinga for making this list let me stop <laughs> uh the teachings of amanamol 30 chapters or notices with the same preoccupation as ani Uh, with perhaps a stronger emphasis on respectful behavior of the person and a more refined religious meaning. Okay, so teaching of Amnimov, which I'm pretty sure is, yes, these are my, the, I don't know why I have more than one Husia, but I'm, I am pretty sure both of those, or at least part of those are in the Husia. Um, all right, so late period. So this is the 21st to 30th dynasties, uh, 1000 um, to 332 BCE. Uh, inscriptions from the tomb of Petrosis, 
uh, and his family around 300 BCE. In these one finds higher expression of sapiential, <laughs> sapiential and sacerdotal spirituality. Eulogy of the holy life of man who follows the will of nature. Ooh, okay. Underlining that one. I like that one. Only because so many people um, like to try to um, divorce spirituality and religiosity from ancient Kemet. Um, a lot of times people will still stick to the spirituality, but they like to be like, oh, they wasn't religious. These were just like ideas. Those weren't, you know... Netru, those weren't gods or sacred beings. Like, no, they were just expressions of energy, you know? And I'm like, yeah, that's true, but it's kind of like undercutting, you know, it. So um, I think that's very interesting, you know, like that might come in handy when it comes to, you know, again, fleshing this thing out and what it looks like and so on and so forth. Uh, this um, overview is obviously very brief. The literary production of ancient Kemet stretches almost 3,000 years, but it's necessary to refer to uh, Kemetic texts themselves to read them directly and to exploit them to its fullest. Now, I think that's interesting that he chose the word exploit them, but I'm pretty sure I, I can understand or make the connection as to what he's trying to say, but I'm going to finish the sentence first. Uh, anthologies are available to those who have no direct access to the... Um, Sashmeru Nature or the written Egyptian language. Um, so it has A. Ehrman, the literature of ancient Egyptians, poems, narratives, and manuals and instructions. So basically, if you are, again, if you are who you say you are as far as you are a Kemite, we need to go to the wisdom text first and then go to secondary sources for context, secondary uh, information to kind of help us understand, make it make sense, blah, blah, blah. So um, this idea of, um, you know, and a lot of times people will do that secondary, like, and and I don't want to be funny, but technically, like, someone would read this and be like, I'm comedic. And it's like, while, okay, you can be, um, Obinga is literally telling us, like, you have to be versed in the actual wisdom texts like you you have to to the point where you're exploiting or you're taking out that information and that is your primary thrust of um philosophy of intellectualism of sociology of psychology of religiosity all of that like everything should come from you know the words of the ancestors uh, essentially but if you can't get that He's giving us other um, books if you don't have access to the originals or the primary sources. Uh, so that's this first book. He goes on to say, W.K. Simpson, The Literature of Ancient Egypt, an anthology of stories, instructions, and poetry. Uh, Miriam Litcham. So again, these three books right here. Uh, volume 1, 2, and 3. Um, ancient Egyptian literature, one, two, and three. Um, CL, I don't know what the first name is. Lalouette. Uh, texte sec et texte profane de l'Echien Egypte. Eight years of French, and that's what I got for you. <laughs> and then G. Lebevre. L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E. -E -E. uh, Romans et canton Egyptian de l'époque. L'époque? Uh, oh, yeah, l'époque pharaonique. Yes, okay. So, ha, ha, ha. Eight years came in handy. <laughs> it wasn't in vain. <laughs> so, um, two French books. So, um, I'm pretty sure one came out in 87, the other one in 1949. So I'm pretty sure by now there should be, um, either translated versions or, um, you know, I think for me personally, and this is like, 
beginner slash lazy scholarship in my opinion but you know if i can't find something in another language or like i don't want to sit and try to translate it or or there is no english i um, you can always find um a journal article talking about the actual um text the original text and you know they'll quote it so you'll be able to at least read part of it um you know, if you can't get it in, in, you know, your language. So I think that's my two cents, if you will. Uh, three, some concepts and themes of comedic philosophy. Uh, having defined what must be understood by, quote, philosophy and precisely African philosophy, after going over method methodological demands for any study of African philosophy. After stressing the importance of pharaonic philosophy in the chronological global context of history of African and of world philosophy, and after briefly stating the documentation, studies, syntheses, anthologies related to African philosophy of pharaonic period, it is now time to try to highlight a few concepts and themes of this uh, African philosophy of the pharaonic period. So, uh, the comedic concept of the world before the world and the advent of the world as we know it. I'm like, sir, you could have literally just said creation. <laughs> he said all of that. Creation. Uh, the world as it is now, heaven, earth, stars, planets, vegetation, animals, man, life, death, civilization, is the work of nature or of the demiurge creator. Okay. Hence, at the beginning of beginnings, there was nature, nature before the world. The world is created by nature. There isn't a world before or something whatever before nature. Um, almost all religions and known cosmogenies... Oh, I lost my place. Oh, hold this vision, which puts the creator nature or god before anything that exists light darkness the constituting elements of the universe the universe itself in its totality and its globality thus uh saint augustine for instance explains that the mass of the world uh universa mundi moles the sun the moon the stars the sky earth birds terrestrial animals water fish man in short all exist is truly the work of nature but Nature did not create his works or opera for nothing, nor from matter foreign to him or previous to him. So self-created. Uh, non de aliqua non tua vel que ante ferit. There goes Latin. You can tell I never took Latin. <laughs> uh, but from uh concreted matter that is to say from matter created by nature simultaneously with the works created from that very matter created by nature aka god made everything the end oh do our nature um can i give pointers on how to get started um Huh. Um, so, uh, I often just, um, so there is a question and I'm just going to answer the question real quick. Um, or maybe not quick. We'll see how, <laughs> we'll see how, how much I keep to that. Um, so the comment is, um, and do for, or Nahem for, um, saying that I'm doing a good job, um, explaining the concepts. Uh, so the question is how can I start practicing and applying um, as well as giving pointers on how to get started. So um, I have been asked this question before and I do find it a little um, complex. So I hope I don't like turn you off with my answer, but my answer is always, it depends because each person is coming from a different place. So it depends on like your understanding of spirituality you know, pre before this, um, you know, your relationship or connection or not, 
uh, because there are some people who they come from the Muslim faith. They come, we come from Christian faiths. We come from uh, being atheists. We like we come from all different places. So um, everyone's starting point is just going to be different. Uh, so that's the first thing I usually say. Uh, but as far as practicing, uh, the easiest thing I would say is, um, and this is something that I um, I do have on my blog. So in the way Mignette organizes things, I do it similarly to like, I guess, college in a way where, you know, you have your zero, zero, one, where that is your absolute foundation of foundations. Like, let's say it's your high school 12th grade um, version before you go into college. So that would usually be, um, I, I find Mustafa Gadala's books are very helpful. And even though they're not primary sources, um, usually I start saying, or I recommend primary sources at like a 101. But if you're like super, super, I don't have outside of what I learned in high school, um, I don't have any other context other than maybe YouTube. Um, the best few books to start out with would be um, Egyptian Cosmology, I believe it's called, by Mustafa Gadala, and uh, Egyptian Divinities by Mustafa Gadala. Those two, to me, are like hands down the absolute first books I would always recommend uh, for new people to the um, who want to be practicing Chemites in the 21st century. Um, I'm like, give me a second. I'm like, let me turn around. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yep. I'm like, let me, I don't want to drop anything. Oh my God, I really did pack them in there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, so you know what? I'll just take pictures, but um, one is black and green and the other one is like a light blue. So that's them right there. Um, but again, Mustafa Gadala, he has other um, books, but the reason why I like him is his chapters are like, yay, two, three pages. Uh, five pages like they're really simple straightforward and to the point and explaining certain uh, just basic foundational stuff um, after that um, I would usually recommend um, I think the next two books would be even though like I like the Husia, I feel like it's very user friendly very beginner friendly um, I am a little biased in my recommending it only because, um, it is from, uh, like after, oh gosh, what, are, what, are, what are those guys' names? When the Greeks took over. I, I don't know why I can't, like the name's escaping me right now, but, um, so I, I kind of, I'm like, uh, I, I would like something a little older than that, but I like the way, um, Milana Karanga put that together. Um, as far as just kind of combine, compiling things, um, because again, it starts to really just talk about like morals, values, how we as Chemites kind of see the world, view the world, how we should treat people. Um, I would definitely say, look at, uh, the 42 Tepra Ma'at. Um, I know I have personally, like I enjoy listening to it every day, twice a day. Um, I literally listen to it on my way to work and then I listen to my prayers and then, you know, when I come home and everything like that. Um, so I commit that to memory or I try my best to commit it to memory. When you get out of practice, you forget stuff. But, um, I have the 42 hanging like right above uh, in my bathroom, so like if you're washing your face, brushing your teeth or whatever, it's there. I have it right before I walk out my my um, my home. So it really is just something that, um, you know, any, any faith, any uh, way of life, you know, you always want to start with a foundation. So, um, and knowing why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I know a lot of times people will kind of start things and then put it down, start it and put it down. And, um, you know, just practicing the comedic faith, it's definitely a shift. It's not, honestly, a lot of the people on um, social media, it's not really the way that they explain it. It's not really the way YouTube presents it where it's just a bunch of people arguing with each other. Like, that's not really the way it is. That's not how we're supposed to behave. <laughs> 
but you know it gets people views and checks so they do what they do uh but if you're really serious the i would definitely say start out with the two mustafa gadala books maybe get the husia if you and again just understand that it's like a beginner's book and then eventually you'll branch out and and get into more wisdom text i like to say um egyptian proverbs that's also like a very beginner book that i found to be helpful um and then I, after that um Gosh, it, it, it's like, it's so different for everyone. Uh, but I would definitely say that would be a very strong starting point to just understand like, well, what is this comedic thing really about? What, you know, what kind of lifestyle am I looking to get into? You know, what are the expectations? What is the code? All of that good stuff. So I think those would be a really, really strong, like beginner, beginner, no matter what kind of faith or background you came from, I think those would be really good ones. Um, after that, um, as I said on my, um, on my blog, on my website, um, I do have like the 001, then I have a 002 because, you know, then you have to have cultural context. And then after that, I get into 101, 102, um, 101, 201, 301, and then 401. And then eventually, um, I would also always recommend, um, looking into a shrine, a temple, a, a community of some sort um, because you know it's a very Americanized westernized idea of like independence and um, that is not what Kemet was about um, and we're not talking politics or anything like that it's just this idea of like ma'at interdependence what you do affects me what I do affects you so community is a very very big part of that so um, just finding community and not just like an online group of people because um, the purpose of having a community is one, to help you be this person who you say you wanna be, to um, cultivate ma'at on earth. You know, when we're alone, we, are, we allow ourselves to get away with things that you know, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get away with. And when we kinda have other people you know, to um, lean on, it makes it a little easier to actually do what we say we're gonna do. And now granted, we know human beings are fallible. They are not perfect. They are, you know, so there are many different communities. You might just have to find what community uh, works for you. Uh, but definitely try those uh, four books. Um, and then from there, you know, I would after that rec start recommending uh, get into some wisdom texts. But also, you know, it's kind of like you got to do a couple things at a time at the same time it takes a process like the minyet that you see here is i don't even remember i need to be better at remembering this i think this is like 13 14 years in the making so um you know definitely don't compare yourself to other people um don't compare yourself to the people on youtube or and and stuff like that because um you know even there are people who've been doing it even longer than me and you know, it's hard to be like, oh my gosh, I should be there. I should know this. I should, don't beat yourself up. It's a process. And again, at the end of the day, why are you doing this? Why do you want to do this? What is the purpose of this in your life? So if you're trying to cultivate ma'at, if you want to have a more ma'atic life, if you are looking to have more ma'atic relationships and stuff like that, then keep at it. And you know, things will, things will unfurl as they are, are meant to. But um, that is my really short response. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm so long-winded. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Like, I just, once I get going. So, um, oh, no worries. And feel free, again, like, come back, um, ask questions. Um, yeah, I think that's the easiest thing. And I know that's me. That's how I learn. So I ask a lot of questions. Um, I like to think of myself as being inquisitive. Um, some people say it's nosy. Some people say it's annoying. But, you know, you know how you best learn. You know kind of what you need. So um, just kind of see what, what different people are doing those things and just have try to have more conversations try to um there are a lot of book lists out there i would say you know again be careful um uh, 
not just be careful of who you're following and who you're listening to, but be careful of like your diet of, of literature and, and things like that too. Um, because honestly, that's, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, no lie, honesty moment. Um, there are a lot of books that I'm reading now that I really wish I read 10 years ago as opposed to now. I feel like I personally would just be further in my understanding, which is one of the reasons why I like doing this. Uh, because it just gives me, you know, a, a purposeful time to study. I think that's the other thing. Now that I'm like thinking of it out, out loud. What, the part of being a spiritual person is you have to study. You really have to be about it. Um, so like if we're saying like going through the 42 and like I will not pollute my body, but then we're still eating fast food, we're still drinking, we're still smoking, we're still doing all these things. So it's like, well, why, why study all these books? Why do all of that if we're not going to put it into practice? And that takes time. It really just is, it takes time because it's a, it's a shift. It's, it's very much not what we're used to uh, in the West and, and just American living. American living is like here now, fast, let's go. I'm, you know, this is what benefits me. If you don't benefit me, you gotta go and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not Kemet elements of it. Yes, got that in common, but not really. Oh no. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So the comment is, um, this, that, um, they were trying to learn, but at times it just seemed very complex. So sometimes people are purposely like they try to be complex because either one, they don't understand it themselves Two, they're trying to impress people and make, you know, it's about their ego and just showing like how much they know. Um, or it's complex cause they don't live it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I am uh, a person and I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I want to make money, I will purposely dangle things over people's head that I know they don't know what I'm talking about. But because I, they don't know what I'm talking about, they're more willing to keep listening to me. So, you know, it's kind of like a marketing kind of a thing. Like it's, yeah, so um, don't be discouraged. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, look at different teachers, look at different people, look at what they're doing. Um, a lot of people will say like, oh, we don't need leaders. We don't need leaders, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know about you, but anything I know from Kemet, Kemet always had somebody. There was always some sort of nasut. There was already, there was always somebody at the head. So um, just don't, don't be afraid to learn from people and when you find someone who really like, you know what, they're onto something, then stick with them. Stick with them until you feel either you've grown or stick with them and stay with them. You know, every like I said, everybody is different. Um, yeah, I, th I think that would be the very, 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 very long response. <laughs> so it, it doesn't have to be complex, that's just people People being people, it, it's really, really not that complex. Like, um, I think that's one of the beautiful things about the ancestors uh, and the beautiful things about ancient Kemet is that it's just, it's so complex that it's simple. And it's so simple that it's complex. And it's always that way. So just like when I was saying earlier, I was talking about the title of the Pert and Peru, the book of coming forth by day. And I'm like, well, if you think about dying, you know, like anything we've ever seen with movies, it's like, you know, things fade to black, things this, that, and the third. But, you know, just like to, to quoteth the great Lion King, it's the circle of life. The sun sets, the sun rises again. So if that's everyday life, if that's nature, if we do that every night, we get tired, we go to bed, we wake up at dawn. Or, you know, I mean, if you work night jobs, that's different. But um, the idea is, when sunlight, you know, comes out, like that's a good thing. So we want to try to emulate. And again, that's one of the beautiful things about being uh, comedic is we observe nature to know ourselves. We see like this is the natural order of things. So how do I fit into that? How do I get in that groove? How do I get in that line? And so it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I mean, that's just a nerd. I just like books. I like reading. I like 
knowing things. <laughs> you know, like that's just that's just me. But um it really doesn't you know, even if I didn't have all of this stuff, it's about well, what am I doing with it? Like you said, is it makes it difficult to apply because everybody's just talking about books, books, books. History, history, history. But just like I, I often tell my students, like like today we were talking about uh, finance and I said, you know, I could teach you all about money. I could teach you about investing. I could teach you about, you know, getting free money to further your education, this, that, and third. But what is the point if you lose it? It's this. So, you know, as people are saying they want to come to Kemet, I always wonder, it's like, okay, well, what's your mindset? What do you want? You know, just like people say you want to date with intention, you want to come to Kemet with intention. What's your intention? You know? And um, what is your intention and what do you plan to also give? Because again, that's my ot. It's, it's, it's reciprocity. So if the ancestors are giving to you, if, if um, you know, you're getting the knowledge from the books, if you're, you know, gaining a better life, now what are you doing to either pay it forward? Are you, you know, if you have children, are you instilling, you know, certain values and morals into them? Uh, like, you know, how are you paying it forward? Because again, I will not lay to waste the plowed lands. That is, you know, one of the 42, like, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to, um, waste my talents and, and things like that. So, um, it really is just how it applies to you. Cause it, it again, that's the one of the, I think when somebody said that to me before, like, Look at all the Neturu, look at all the, the gods and goddesses that existed in ancient Kemet. There were so many of them. So many kinds of personalities, so many different kinds of stories. And that was just a way for all of us to be able to connect, to understand our own divinity within. So I go back to, you know, it depends on where you are. Ankamaat. It really depends on where one is when they're coming to Kemet, what they're trying to understand, grow, cultivate and then therefore give and it's it's all about that you know like one thing are you trying to heal your ancestors are you trying to have a better relationship with your ancestors are you trying to you know just have a better quality of life are you trying to manifest um the type of life that you always imagined like it, it's so many different things but uh oftentimes and i think maybe this comes from western thinking we look at religion as far as what it can do for us what do i get out of it and um sometimes getting what you get out of it is like being a custodian of the earth being a custodian of animals being a custodian of another generation of kids and you know what i mean like it's again it's all about my art, that reciprocity so <sighs> I mean, yet is getting off the soapbox and i'm getting back to the book <laughs> i just ran my mouth <laughs> oh lord all right so um oh okay so we were we were on page 36 talking about uh the comedic concept of the world overall and essentially uh what obinga was saying is that um within the comedic paradigm just like or very similar to other paradigms is that nature created everything everything came from nature and then the things that came from nature nature used that to create other things everything came from that one source there was nothing before there's no outside or anything like that it's all kind of self-contained so um you know oftentimes people be like well that don't make no sense and it, it's it's kind of like the ultimate chicken or the egg if you have to have a chicken to lay the egg but you have an egg to that needs to hatch a chicken so we don't actually know which one quite came first, but they had to come from each other in some way, somehow. So, you know, um, it's within the realm of possibility. Um, you know, I know oftentimes people, and I have to say this is just from for my own personal interpretation. This does not come from anywhere else. Like, I'm going to claim all of what I'm about to say because this is not something that like, oh, all comedic people believe this. Like, no, this is just straight up Minyat saying her thought. So um, one thing that really, really made the comedic legacy make sense to me, and I will say it is because of that Egyptian cosmology book, um, 
the idea of the Big Bang, like science, and how that was explained, like, you know, one day, things just, you know, atoms, and, I, you know, I can't remember all the science stuff. I teach social studies and finance and stuff, like, I don't know all the science words, but y'all know what I'm talking about. So, all of that happened, and then, boom, existence happened, and I'm like, you know what? When we look at, like, the the various because there are more than one uh creation stories um but you know atum is the self-created atum thought himself into existence and therefore he existed you know we think of consciousness we think of you know babies babies when they look in the mirror and finally recognize hey that's me right there like that's humanity um that we had the noon. The noon was like the primordial waters. And then out of the primordial waters arose um, Atum and... Um, I'm like, oh, is it Atum or was it Amen? Now I feel like a bad Chemite. I'm pretty sure it was Atum though. I'm not going to lie. So, but now I feel like I'm confusing myself in circles. <laughs> it's been a long day. I'm so sorry about that. But... This idea of the primordial waters to get back to what I was trying to say. And it's just like, well, that's how babies are made. Babies are in the womb of primordial water and they arise, AKA the egg sticks and then it grows and then the cells multiply and blah, blah, blah. So it's like anytime I read one of the creation stories, it just reminded me of science. And I was like, damn, they was smart. And that's what got me thinking like, you know what? I think there might be something to this. And again, they existed for thousands of years. So it's just like, you know what? They, they had to be on to something. So whatever they were on to, I want to try to go that direction. So when we say like, what does yet get out of the comedic legacy? I really feel connected. I feel like, you know what? This is, there doesn't have to be an argument between science and, um, and religion. Because it's essentially two different stories talking about the same exact thing. You know, even if we wanted to just take it to the basic biology, the Big Bang, like orgasms. All human beings were created because of orgasms. None of us would be here if our parents didn't do the do and have orgasms and make babies. And you know what I mean? Like, so it's kind of like, oh, well, if humans do this, if animals do this, it, you know, pollination, that's nothing but a bunch of plants having orgasms, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, in general, it just makes sense. Yeah, I feel like that TikTok, <laughs> things in my religion that just make sense. <laughs> so, you know, again, it, it doesn't have to be that complex because it speaks to things we already know we already know to be true we already experience all the time in everyday life even longer answer back to the book okay <laughs> so um the very different schema appears with the explanation of the advent of the world by uh, Kemetic philosophers. For ancient Kemet, before the world, such as it is, before the sky, the earth, men, before death, before the Neturu themselves, before what was had to come into existence in Sep Kepret Cementi, there was something called the noon. See, look, mm, Mignette's on point and she didn't even know she was gonna be on point. Yay, I'm like, this, that's my ego, calm it down. <laughs> I love that when you like be on a good thought and then you read further and you like, oh, makes you feel smart. It's very validating, very, very validating. So this primordial noon can be related to abysmal water, but like, uh, the fluid of ether, not real water. So technically, I mean, if you think about the womb, it's not real water, but it is, you know, nutrient dense, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this fluid, uh, liquid ether, the generators of the Neturu themselves and of the rest of creation, this noon is uncreated, AKA if a woman is getting a cycle and if no egg and, and sperm, you know, come about, you know, menstruation ends up happening. So you can't, you can't have creation without that spark that, okay, that was like the lamest. Okay, this is what happened when you snap with your left. Yeah, it's still not working. But pretend it was really loud and like impactful. So, uh, <laughs> so um, 
The noon is in its initial non-created, the cosmic beforehand, the universe before the actual universe. So again, humanity, our lives, you know, uh, as they say, or one of the things that people always say is like, isn't it interesting, at least, you know, for females, isn't it interesting that you existed at this, uh, within your grandmother, meaning your egg was in your mom, which was in your grandmother. So it's just like, wow, your existence before your existence. So this would be again, the noon, like we were there. Um, this uncreated fluid, uh, eternal liquid, very opaque, dense, compact. Mm, again, I defer back to the science. Um, will be involved through the demiurge in the process of becoming the demiurge himself issuing from the primordial uncreated. Uh, we are now commenting on the pyramid text 1040, 1230, and 1466 BCE. Um, Nature is born in the noon. When I was born in the noon, MC EM new, uh, I am a tomb. Oh, go me. I was right. <laughs> I am a tomb when I alone exist. Being alone in the noon. Oh, oh you hear that alarm? It's trying to kick us off. I'm going to finish this page, though. Um, so, Inik Item M Y M Uen. Because it's all in transliteration. <laughs> it's like reading Latin. It's fun. Fun times. Um, uh, Arek M. Nu. Uh, just so, just so y'all know what I'm talking about. And feel free. If Mignette needs to be corrected, that is okay. I am very okay with being corrected. Because um, we in this together. We gonna learn together. <laughs> so, and I'm like, oh, it's backwards. But y'all see, that's what I was just reading. So, um, and that's page 38. So if you got the book, page 38. Uh, so it means or translates as, it is noon, uh, father of the Neturu. Uh, new, new, new. <laughs> Etiaf, Etiaf? I'm still trying to figure out when the period is in between because I'm like, that's manual decodage and I'm still shaking on manual decodage with some of the symbols. So I forget how you're supposed to read when the period's there, but itif, Neturu. I got that one. I got Neturu. I got that word correct. <laughs> so the noon gives form to the primordial world of the creator Neturu themselves emerging from the noon. I created in the noon when I was still solemnant. Uh, one can read this in the Brenmer Papyrus. The noon is truly that which is primordial and form which everything will exist. So again, we have the nutrients. We have everything that we need once that egg, once that sperm, once that, you know, if it's a healthy uterus and all of that other good stuff, babies is coming. Once, when all those powers combine, they make, well, not Captain Planet for the millennials, but y'all understand what I'm saying. So you got to have the right circumstances. So it's the same thing with creation unto itself. If it's, if it's that way for animals and humans and, and all that other stuff, then it's the same with the Neturu. It's the same with the universe. It all had to start somewhere. Whether it's the chicken or the egg, one of them happened. Okay, so the noon is truly that which is primordial from which everything else will exist. The nature, the sky, the earth, all the living beings, in short, the global world, visible and invisible. Oof, Mignette's going to calm that down because I already know where my brain's going with that one. The noon is the cause, the reason, the foundation, and the principle. Mm, highlight, underline, bold, exclamation point. Let's do that again. The noon is is the cause, the reason, the foundation, and the principle. Mic drop. Oh, 
Oh, so cool. All right. So, um, yo, I, I'm, I really feel like that's like a tattoo in the making. I'm sorry. I'm like a sucker for tattoos. But I really, I really am digging that. So the idea is without the noon, none of this would be here. So therefore it is the cause. It is the reason. Because again, if the cause doesn't happen, there's nothing to refer back to. Therefore, there's no reason for any of this to have existed. Uh -huh. The foundation, again, if the noon wasn't there, if the conditions weren't right, none of us would be here. No humans, no stars, no Netflix, no, what was that? what's that new show? Squid Game or whatever? I'm about to watch that. I told y'all I like them, them K-dramas. So no foundation. And then no principle. There's nothing to live by. If we don't have our starting point, whether we like that starting point or not, whether we agree with that starting point or not, who cares how we feel about the starting point? The point is, it's there. That is the beginning of existence, and that needs to be honored. That needs to be understood. It doesn't need to be something that's like all convoluted and woo, spooky, spooky. It's just this idea of honor the beginning. Because without the beginning, none of this would exist. The end. That's it. No lie, I still think that's going to be a tattoo. I still like that. So from the noon, there is being, development, and knowledge. Again, you need your starting point. You can't learn anything if you don't know your ABCs. You don't know your ABCs if you never learn to talk. If you never learn to talk, then, you know, if you don't have ears to listen and hear, if you don't have eyes to watch, if you don't have a mouth to speak, if you don't have hands to do sign language, whatever. That was like really bad sign language. I, I'm sorry, my bad. <laughs> so again, it's like you always got to go back to the origin and honor that origin. Because again, none of this would exist. The noon is the foundation and the home of all subsequent being. The noon is anterior to all that which is subsequent to it. It is the before, it is the after, uh, will emerge of the uncreated before. Again, I defer back to originally when everybody, when um, the comment was made, oh my God, it's so complex. Like all of that complex stuff, honor the beginning because if the beginning wasn't there, we wouldn't be here and all of that is my aunt. That's it. I mean, if we even want to use our former religiosity, the idea of the alpha and the omega, like that was literally right there. It is the before, it is the after. It is existence. Like, okay, if we wanted to say it in a different way, and forgive me science people, if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me, but I would think of it like air. Air existed before I was born and breathing it. Air is going to exist after I'm dead and gone. Air is air. There's no me judging it. There's no me hating it. There's just, let me, let me give honor to air because without air, I wouldn't be breathing. That's it. And just understanding it for what it is. That's all. So the Demiurge reigns alone, unique in the prior, uh, primordial uncreated. The Demiurge creates from the uncreated from which he also comes. So again, this idea like, okay, we as human beings, we existed when, you know, our parents got together and did the do. So now we exist and then we go out and do the do and we create little humans from ourselves. And we create or create the conditions for them to have their lives and so on and so forth. So, you know, it just kind of, again, it's talking about that, that line. Uh, this explanation of the genesis of the world is still present today in many black African societies. Here's a philosophical text from the Kuba of Kasi or Zaire, quite comparable to the Kemetic text. At the beginning, there was nothing but darkness and there was nothing but water on earth. In the chaos, Bumba, the Chembe, reigned alone. First he vomited the sun, then the moon, then the stars. Excuse me, and this is how light was born. And then he has a chart um, comparing the two stories. So again, depending on which story you're listening to in ancient Kemet, you got the Ben Ben, which was the earth that rose out of the water. You've got um, Atum spitting into his hand. You have Atum ejaculating in his hand um, that, you know, therefore went and created it. Um, I'm like, I'm missing one. Mm. 
I'm missing one. I got three. Which one am I missing? I feel like it's one that has to do with the egg, but I don't know why I'm feeling like that's very Hindu-ish. I'll get back to you on that one. But if you know the story that I'm missing, feel free to leave it down there. Um, you know, help me out. Let me stop. <laughs> All right, so let me finish this page and then we'll be finished for today. So with the concept of the noon, the comedic philosophers laid down the principle at the source of the very uh, constitution of the universe as it is now known by human ingenuity. Thus was laid down quite clearly the radical unity of all beings and elements of the universe emanating and created from a unique principle, a kind of fluid ether. According to the philosophical school of Metellus, founded in Thales, a former pupil of comedic priests, the ultimate principle of the world is not located in chaos or in the ocean or in the night, but in the one, which is precisely for Thales, water, the thing from which all things were formed. So again, even if we're just talking pure science, it's still ancient comedic thought still mirrors what's being said here as far as these are where the beliefs these are why they existed but then we can look at science and be like oh that did exist or you know um there was and this is the last thing i'm, I'm gonna say so we're leaving off on page 39 we're gonna pick up next week on page 40 uh but uh there is this really neat uh, TikTok, and then it got me, it, I went down a rabbit hole with this one. And um, it was talking about APEP. And it showed that there's this place in Northern Kemet where there are like these huge, huge, huge bones. And it's just like, um, and it uses that music, yo, I don't know if y'all on TikTok, but it's that song. And um, it's showing, or what the person who made it was just like, oh, that's the origin of APEP. Now, do I think that's true? Probably not, but I don't necessarily think it's totally out there. Meaning, we all know that um, up south Kemet, you know, because of um, the Ice Age, you know, it became, first it was a lot of water, and then it became a desert. So where this thing is, and I need to find the, the name of it, and I'll post it in my Instagram feed, where they were talking about that whales and sea, like huge sea turtles and all these sea animals got trapped in the land and died, and then all of their bones are there. And I was just like, oh my gosh, could you imagine being like pre-dynastic, because that's, you know, Ice Age was pre-dynastic Kemet, and seeing like a whale, a dead whale or a whale carcass or big whale bones. You know what I mean? Like that totally makes sense when I'm sitting here thinking about like all these stories of floods, all these stories of water, all these stories of like, you know, um, evil things coming out of the waters and, and stuff like that. Like it totally makes sense because again, to me, again, this is all men yet. This is not all comedic people, but to men yet, it, it just seems to all make sense that it just kind of fits together like the gears in a car to make things go. It just makes sense to me. Things in my religion that just make sense. So, um, so again, as I said, we are reading the book Ancient Egypt and Black Africa by Theophile Obinga. And we are leaving off on page or we're going to start on page 40 next week. Um, if you have time, feel free to um, like this share this you know i gotta give my spiel um follow me um i have definitely tried to up my ante as far as uh just putting way more content out there because just the stuff that i see for for people who are aspiring to be comedic and not really located to a temple already or a shrine is like very far and few between and it just this idea of like well how do we actually live that so that is what um, my platform is all about, um, like 
the practical applications and studying uh, for being a comedic person in the 21st century. So we have the Facebook group, um, Comedic Living in the 21st Century. It is a private group, but feel free to join us over there where we have uh, conversations, share information, stuff like that. Uh, feel free to follow and go over on my blog. Um, and I have just different um, posts that I've written about just various topics and will continue to. Uh, I have my YouTube channel where um, I'm slowly, that's like my next push next month is to just get more into my uh, YouTube and kind of posting more how-to videos or commentary videos um, about what people say about us as a group or um, how we behave or how we're viewed. Um, certain vocabulary or, or uh, defamatory statements being said about us. So I kind of like, you know, try to give that person on the street or like the everyday person view. Um, because again, a lot of the people out there, they're like, oh, I'm a priest this, I'm priestess that. Or, you know, it's, it's not everyday people. You don't really see a lot of everyday people kind of living as comedic people. So, um, and then I'm trying to think, I think, that's it. So uh, next week, Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be back here. We will pick up the book. If y'all have any questions, feel free to uh, send me DMs, leave comments, um, or just come next week and be ready, ready to, to converse. So until then, Amatu and Panatir, Sawek to Menten Panatir, Audwa Uma Keti Paharu. Give yourself to Nature Daily, keep yourself for Nature Daily, and may tomorrow be as today. See you all next week and stay safe. Show me a matap. We have a reflection of our ancestors. We like to thank you for the building blocks you left us. This is your spirit possessed to show you blessed us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.